to be successful today, how we manage networks, not how we manage our direct reports. How we work in networks is how we create disproportionate change in the world. If you're a chief marketing officer, it's not just about what your marketing does, it's your partnership with the sales organization and the, and the product organization. You can be the CMO, the head of sales, the head of product, all of those jobs are the chief growth officer and it's all about creating a partnership among those critical individuals. That's success, it's about the team. I think we've over-indexed on leadership and we've under-indexed on teamship and that's been my passion um, for the last 20 years. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast, number one, New York Times bestselling author, I think multiple times, one of the world's greatest authorities on helping both people and organizations succeed, Keith Ferrazzi. Welcome, Keith. Andrew, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Me too, brother. So what most people might know you for is you wrote this number one New York Times bestselling book called Never Eat Alone that kind of set the world afire. <laughs> it became, uh, the, you know, the, this, frankly, it was like a business book, a, a self-development book. Um, and, and I have to say, it's an inspired title because it really makes you think. It's like, huh, I really do eat a load a lot. <laughs> and it might, might be, I'm missing opportunities. So what, what led up to, to that, uh, that book? Well, I don't know how far in the rabbit hole you want to go by asking that question, but I'll, I'll start to peel back the onion and you tell me Please. when to stop. The, the simple story was that um, I had a disproportionately, um, incredibly successful young career. <clears throat> I was the chief marketing officer of Deloitte before I was 30. Crazy. I was the chief <laughs> marketing officer at all of Starwood Hotels and Resorts and head of sales uh, in my early 30s. And um, as a result, somebody came to me and said, uh, you, you know, we'd like to write an article about you. And, and I said, well, let me think about it. And the question was, what precipitated your success? And, I, and this is a piece of advice for any of your listeners. Um, I paused instead of just blurting out because it was supposed to be one of these wraparound pieces that 20 people were gonna be interviewed, et cetera. But I, but I said, let me get back to you tomorrow. Let me do the work. And overnight, I came back with what, what, I, what I thought were my 10 secrets of success. And I handed it to him. Well, he went back to his editor and he said, shit, we've got something here. Let's just write the piece on this guy. And it ended up being a major feature in Inc. Magazine, which was one of their runaway best-selling um, uh, pieces. And it was called 10 Secrets of a Master Networker. I hated the title. I did <laughs> not. I was, a, I was a thought leader, a businessman. I was a lot of things. I was a philanthropist. I was, I was like, I cared about changing the world. What the fuck? I, I was not like the networking guy. And I was so disgusted by the, by the article that I hired the author, the writer from, from Inc. Magazine. And I said, I'm going to punish you. You're going to work with me. And we're going to tell the full story about how it's not about networking, but it's about true authentic relationships. I said, we're going to write a book. So we ended up writing the bigger story, which ultimately became a global bestseller. Now, the, the thing that I was saying in terms of it's a it's an interesting question. So you did this in addition to your day job as CMO of Starwood? <laughs> no, I had left Starwood by then and I was working for Michael Milken. Um, I was the CEO. I've always wanted to, to run something. And so I realized back in the day you couldn't go from CEO from CMO. And I needed to go into something smaller. So Michael Milken gave me one of his portfolio companies to be CEO of. I moved to Los Angeles and I was running uh, a computer games company at the time uh, for Mike. And yes, I did do it while that was happening, but I had an extraordinary partner. My co-writer uh, was just extraordinary and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a beautiful process. It, I've written many books since, probably one of the, this was probably one of the easiest books that I, I've written. It, it's interesting, when you write your first book, you know, you've got the content of 30 years of getting prepared for that first book. And then when it's successful, the publisher wants your next book in a year. 
<laughs> so you've got to scramble to to find the content for that second book. Okay, so this book takes off in a way that's completely probably like you know like no one could have predicted it, uh, unforeseen, shall we say? I mean, even if you are a confident guy, you're not going to be like this is going to become a global bestseller <laughs> and the rest of it. Um, so does that end up taking over your life for a particular period? Because I know when that happens, um, the press wants a hold of you all the time. Uh, conferences want you all of the time. Is that your story? <laughs> uh, I can share my story if you want. I mean, it's good fun because like I, I wrote my, my, my first book and the world did not like, you know, notice, <laughs> which, which by the way, I think is a much more normal set of experiences. I mean, you've had like a... No, not with your book, but with your presidency run. It was inspiring. I just want to let you know that as an outsider who, you know, wasn't a part of your inner circle, you deeply inspired me with your, your, your insights, your words, your passion, your pursuit. And, uh, I was definitely rooting for your mission in the, in the world. So it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, well, 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 thank you, Keith. I'll, I'll tell you what, what happens at a time like that is, is interesting. And this is another small bit of advice for those watching. I really did resent being the networking guy. In fact, sure. the cover of the, of the book, I, I forced them to have up on the cover relationships that power your success. I forget what the original tagline was, but they wanted it to be, you know, something about networking. Tips of a master networker. <laughs> Tips of a master networker, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, but what, what I missed, I really missed an opportunity, Andrew, and I, I reflect upon this with humility, that when you have momentum in life, grab it. And the power of, of prestige, the power of being in the spotlight and having a podium is something that one shouldn't look askance to. I mean, it's something that is very powerful and it's a, it's a gift, it's a blessing, and it should be relished, even at the small level of inside of a company. I mean, there are, there are people that I know, you know, young people who have had a lot of success in their companies and their companies love them, and, and they, but they're successful in an area that maybe someday they wanna be in a different area and they shun that success and they're looking for, for something that is other than what they're currently have momentum around. And the powerful thing about capturing momentum is, you know, you may never have it again at that level. And, and what I've always found is that having success under your belt can always be pivoted to other types of success. But running away from momentum into other things that you may be interested in or dalliances, etc. cetera, the, these things can actually really uh, be a missed opportunity for a lifetime. So when I, the one thing I think about when I think about Never Eat Alone was, you know, that book came out and this was pre-podcast days. This was pre-everything. And what I was is I was a CEO and I had just, we had just exited the company um, and I had started Farazi Greenlight and I was going to be focused on thought leadership, research, and coaching executive teams. I wanted to coach the most powerful teams in the world, the most powerful corporate teams in the world. I wanted to coach, you know, the, the cabinet of the United States. I wanted to coach all hey man, of these if different I, things. If, 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 if I were president, you would be the cabinet's coach, but continue. <laughs> well, we can make, we, maybe we can take another run at it. Maybe we could take, it was very interesting. There were years ago where I was actually having active dialogues with, um, with Hillary Clinton about just that. And, um, but, and so as a result, I was really afraid of being the networking guy and I didn't capitalize on it. I didn't do the podcast. I didn't do the things like other friends of mine who were at the same level as I was at the time, like Tim Ferriss. He's like, I want to see this podcasting thing over here. Um, and you know, the, the, all my only advice to everybody, look, I've had an extraordinary career and I've gone on to create some extraordinary works. My books are focused on leadership and teams. You know, we coach some of the most prestigious teams in the world. I write for every magazine possible. I am so blessed in my career. But I do look back and say, what power could I have had in my, in my, in my platform had I not run away from the momentum that I had as I did at the time? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you were bombarded with requests and you're just like, well, I can't speak at all these conferences. <laughs> What's going on? It was also the topic. I wanted to be focused on teams and leadership, not just networking. And it's funny because you, you wake up 20 years from then and leadership is about networking. That's why I wrote the book Leading Without Authority, 
Leading without authority teaches us that to be successful today, how we manage networks, not how we manage our direct reports, how we work in networks is how we create disproportionate change in the world. If you're a chief marketing officer, it's not just about what your marketing does, it's your partnership with the sales organization and the, and the product organization. I was speaking to a woman yesterday who's getting back into the workforce. She was a CMO, she went and did an entrepreneurial gig and it failed. Now she's getting back into the workforce and, you know, and, I, and, she's, and, I, and I'm trying to explain to her, the biggest thing you need to convince a CEO as a CMO is that you're gonna partner like hell with your head of sales and drive revenue and outcomes. Not that you're a great brand person. You need to talk about the partnership of transforming the growth of a business and, and being the chief growth officer. You could be the CEO, I'm sorry, you could be the CMO, the head of sales, the head of product. All of those jobs are the chief growth officer and it's all about creating a partnership among those critical individuals. That's success, it's about the team. I think we've over-indexed on leadership and we've under-indexed on teamship. And that's been my passion um, for the last 20 years. I am pumped to announce that I have a novel coming out on September 12th, The Last Election. It's a political thriller co-written with my friend Stephen Marsh, who wrote the book, The Next Civil War. If you listen to this podcast, Stephen's been a repeat guest. Stephen and I became friends and thought we should collaborate on a way to scare the shit out of people, but also entertain them with a story of what could happen in this upcoming election or the election thereafter. Do check it out at andrewyang.com slash books. And there's a special discount code last election that you can use for 30% off at the publisher's website. I'll be talking more about this book, but I'm so pumped to get this out into the world. Last election coming your way. Yeah, you, you talk about co-elevating um, and and finding ways that everyone wins, which I think is, by the way, the secret to building a uh, quality network is that you're just trying to help other people succeed a lot of the time. And sometimes the benefits to yourself are completely unclear. <laughs> and that's the one thing I'm happy that Never Eat Alone did, is it did pivot this understanding that building your network is not about getting a lot out of other people. It's actually investing in people and deepening authentic relationships. And if you live your life saying, being purposeful, number one, there's nothing wrong with saying, what do I wanna be in life? And who are the people I need to get to know to be there? That's perfectly acceptable. A lot of people get sketchy when they say, well, building purposeful relationships is fake. No, building fake relationships is fake. Building authentic relationships purposefully is strategic. And if you want to be whatever you want to be in life, look at the pathway of people that will help you get there and then go out there and authentically build generous relationships in being of service to those individuals. That's really the key, the golden key to unlocking a lot of success. I grew up very poor. My old man was an unemployed steel worker in Pittsburgh um, during the 70s. And my nepotism had to be created. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful expression. And the way, I, you know, nepotism is nothing more than somebody who loves you, who's gonna give you a leg up in the world. And then if that's true, then make sure that the people who you love and love you are individuals who can open doors and, and share deal flow and um, find opportunities and teach you things. Th this is what, this is what nepotism is all about, but you can create it for yourself. Yeah, there's some people that run away from the relationships they might be able to bring to the table, and, and that's a mistake as well. It's like, look, if you've got relationships, use them. There's no shame in that. <laughs> you know, that's a young person. I hear this all the time. Uh, I don't ask my father for whatever. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to ask my uncle for whatever. I, I just, I get so frustrated and angry with young people who say things like that. I only wish... You know, my father only wished he could have given that to me, and I only wished my father could have given that to me. I believe that the greatest sin is being put on this planet and not making the biggest ripple impact and not making the biggest footprint that you possibly can. So our job in this world is to make an impact. 
in the world while we're here. Now, you can define that if you mean that with your family, God bless you. If you mean that with whatever, you could define how you want to define impact. For me, it's through the workforce. I want to um, I want to make people's lives different and better. Similar to a very good friend of mine, Andrew. I don't know. I think you met along the way my dear friend, Tony, uh, uh, Tony, Tony Shea. Shea. Sure. sure. Yeah, so when Tony died, uh, he was one of the greatest influencers on my life in terms of understanding humans in the workplace. When Tony died, I created the Tony Shea Award. And if any of your listeners out there consider yourselves radical innovators like Tony around human capital, go to thetonysheaaward.com and apply for the award. Um, You know, for me, my ability to make an impact in the workplace it, you know, it's like that's I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a minister and then I wanted to be president. I get to do all of that right now just to be helpful in people's lives. But I got people five days a week in the workplace. Yeah, I'm, I'm the son of immigrants. Um, and so my, my parents did a lot for me in terms of, uh, you know, education, uh, hard work that sort of thing. Um, but I agree. You just use whatever you've got, <laughs> you know, like, like if, if you've got it, use it as long as you're doing something positive. Uh, and one of the big mistakes people make is they, they think, uh, they reverse this relationship. They think you do things because you know people. And what I say is, you know, people because you do things like Mm -hmm. I, I built all of these relationships because I was trying to do something that other people had an interest in or wanted to help with. And some of the relationships are lifelong, you know, it because they're so, uh, pure, uh, you know, like you both care deeply about this thing and you both worked hard on it. I've got relationships that, you know, at different times in my life, I wanted to achieve different things. When I was an entrepreneur, I was thinking I wanted to be a venture backed CEO for the rest of my life. And we did a small one um, and then we exited. And that's when I started Farazi Greenlight. But I got to know an entire group of individuals in the venture capital community, other entrepreneurs, et cetera. And what's interesting about that is even though that's not my world anymore, now I know some of the most powerful venture capitalists and unicorn CEOs, et cetera, who are incredibly co-creative with me. Um, You know, I find that every twist and turn, even as a young man, when I was wanting to run for president of the United States, I was building- I highly recommend it, Keith. Not too late. (laughs) Not too late. At 56, we'll see. Um, But you know what? It's actually interesting. And the reason I, I mean, I, I was grooming my life to be president. I went to Yale and I ran for city council in New Haven. I moved to a district where I could run for Congress that I think I could win. Um, And it was just about that time right out of university that I started to realize that I was gay. And back um, back in the 80s, that would not fly if you were going to be gay and run for president of the United States or even Congress. There wasn't a Barney Frank, there wasn't anybody who is openly gay. There wasn't even a, I mean, at that point in time, Liberace claimed to be straight. So there was literally nobody out there that was willing to come forward. Oscar Wilde, but look what that got him. Um, and for, for me, that pivot, what was interesting was that the pivot to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to be able to be president of the United States, but perhaps uh, the same people who supported me on the way here could help me pivot. And I was like under debt from school, et cetera. I'm gonna go to Harvard Business School, but I couldn't afford it. And so the same individuals that were ready to support me for Congress bought into my mission that I was gonna change the world through business and gave me loans to go to Harvard Business School. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and you you talked about Tony Shea. Tony Shea uh, is a hero and role model to so many entrepreneurs, so many people uh, in, the Asian American community for sure. And, uh, he and I, uh, shared time together. I met his family, which, which made, uh, his passing all the more heartbreaking. So congratulations to you for, uh, inaugurating an award in his memory. I'm sure he'd be honored and proud. This is, um, this is the Tony Shea award. Um, it's very suiting (laughs) or fitting. He only wore one black ASICS shoe. It's the only thing that he ever wore because he was such a minimalist. He taught me how to only wear black t-shirts to, to decrease choice in your mind when you get up in the morning to stay focused. But you know what we say is we now have thousands of people applying for this award. 
Nobody can fill Tony's shoes, but thousands coming in his path who are equally radically innovating in human capital collectively might be able to. So we're really excited about what we're doing with the Tony Shea Award. Yeah, c congratulations. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Having a good mattress has always struck me as one of the best investments you can make because you spend a lot of time on that mattress and having a healthy night's sleep gives you energy for the day, keeps you healthy, makes you capable of doing all the things you want to do. Why would you sleep on a mattress that's made for someone other than you, especially in 2023? With Helix Sleep, you can take a personalized quiz, get one of their 14 unique mattresses sent right to your door, have a 100-night trial, and a 10-plus year warranty. Yeah, they have that much confidence in their products, in part because they're manufactured right here in the USA, and it's the number one mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. One of the people that you and I have in common is a young man named Jack Liang, uh, who um, is this young, up-and-coming uh, entrepreneur. Uh, how did you get connected to Jack, and how the heck do you choose among, frankly, the um, gajillion young people who I'm sure would, would love to um, have any kind of relationship with you? Maybe I'll, I'll spin back a little bit. So um, I, have, uh, I have six boys. Um, and I'll describe what I mean by that. Um, so when my former partner and I were thinking about children, we had to ask ourselves, do we go the surrogacy route? Um, which was a possibility, but I was leaning toward, there must be so many amazing kids out there who don't have parents and need homes. Why would we bring another child into the world when we could find uh, somebody in need. So I started working with a group out of Los Angeles called Kids Save, which did a matching program for foster care, where instead of wow. just being a foster parent and they throw kids into your house, you know, which may not want to be there, they may not be a match, they provided a matching program where you could become a big brother, big sister. Uh, and then over time, bring that child into your home if the if the click worked and they, wow. they they wanted to bring that child into your home as a foster parent and then adopt and through that we had um two two boys um very very difficult um backgrounds we got them at 12 and 16 into our lives and um i can go through lots of information about foster care and what i learned about it and we took that program then i went and worked with governor governor hickenlooper who had become a good friend and was very progressive, I brought to Senator Hickenlooper now the idea, and we've then brought it to Colorado. So this is something I believe strongly in, um, you know, just as so, you know, 80% of the U.S. prison population came from foster care. We need to fix foster care. It's a massive problem, and it's where a lot of my foundation efforts work. But that said, so having gotten through two kids in foster care with a lot of anger, and, you know, having been in 21 homes before in, in our home, it was, it was tumultuous and difficult. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Um, one of the boys is still very, I consider both of them my sons. One of the boys is still um, very close. Uh, the other one is not. Um, and I, but I took a deep breath and I said, what am I going to do about kids? I mean, my relationship with my father was so important to me. And, you know, I wasn't ready to go back into foster care again. Um, I was single at the time. And, and I started realizing what, what came to me was a young entrepreneur, not, not Jack, another young entrepreneur named Jacobo. He was working in my company and he ended up uh, needing a place to stay. And I had a big house, empty nest. And I said, why don't you stay there? And here's an extra car and we'll build this company together. And, you know, he and his girlfriend lived there most of the time, but it became a very tight relationship. And he had had a struggled relationship with his father. And at some point along the way, he just started calling me pops. 
Um, that's beautiful. And it, <laughs> and it was fantastic. And, I, and, and, his da- and his girlfriend at the time was like a daughter-in-law. And, and it made me realize that family can be very different. So spin ahead to uh, an ayahuasca retreat. I'm not sure if I need to explain what that is to your, your viewers. They can look it up if they don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was at a spiritual retreat in Costa Rica. And, um, and I, was, I was helping, I'm not a shaman, but I was helping to organize the peer-to-peer support and some of the, the work that's done around the medicine that's, that's delivered. And, um, and, and there was this young man, Jack. And during ceremony, I was, um, I was sitting there and I was imagining myself and my old age. And I, and what I was visioning was myself as a very old tree. And there were young vines around using that tree for sustenance, etc. And ironically, after the ceremony, I was about to share this, this powerful story and Jack shared the same story that had envisioned to him that he had found a mentor and, and it was a deep connection that we had had at that spiritual retreat. Um, and Jack became um, the second of my now uh, four boys, I mean, the fourth of my now four boys. And subsequently I have two others who like they and their, their wives and girlfriends, they spend all of their Christmases with us, etc. And it's been one of the greatest blessings of my life to have formed and shaped a family that might not look exactly like other people think of as family. The Ford Tour is coming to a city near you. That means I'm coming to a city near you. I'm heading to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Raleigh, Denver, and more in the spring. Go to FordParty.com to check out the upcoming dates or just check out my social media. Primarily Twitter, unfortunately. See you soon. Well, Jack's a tremendous young man, and uh, he's thrilled to have you uh, as a mentor. Uh, And it, it speaks volumes about the kind of person that you are. Um, so I was joking earlier about how a lot of people eat alone more now, like, you know, probably myself included. Like, how do you feel about this new era of work culture? And I, I want to share a little bit about my own journey in this. So uh, I've run a couple of startups and uh, nonprofits, and I was very, very into workplace culture. Um, I considered myself uh, like a reasonable culture setter. Um, but I, I thought that uh, it was very important to be together in one place, uh, to build relationships, to have this sort of trust. So now we're in this work from home era. And if you ask most employees what they want to do, they want to work from home. Um, a lot of people who are heads of organizations are on the other page where they're saying, look, like we got to get back into the office. Um, and, and then there are communities that are somewhere in between. If you're in a downtown corridor, you very much want people back in the office. <laughs> you, you must have organizations coming at you up the wazoo asking, what the heck do we do with this? Um, what's your perspective, both from the individual worker um, and then to the CEO or the person running an org? Well, I am so excited you asked me that question because this is the core of research that my group has been doing since 2010. So I was coaching somebody named John Chambers and his executive team at Cisco. Um, He was the CEO there. And John um, had birthed WebEx, telepresence, all of these virtual communications in 2010 before anybody else had. Eric Yoon, by the way, was at Cisco at the time, um, the chairman of, of Zoom. What was interesting was I started asking the question, this virtual thing is going to be impactful to business. And I approached Harvard Business School Press and I said, I'd like to do a study, a five-year study of teams that are remote first and hybrid. This is in 2010. And we did, we published somewhere 12 to 15 pieces in Harvard Business Review during that period of time. And it was called, what are the new people rules in a virtual world? So you can ask me any question. I could be able to give you some insight. What was interesting 
back then is nobody read those pieces, nobody cared, nobody believed in remote work. And then in 2020, I raised $5 million um, to do a new study, which ultimately ended up in this book, Competing in the New World of Work. Wow. And we published 30 or 40 pieces around this inflection point and what is now available to us in remote and hybrid work. So let me give you um, some really interesting data that will shock you a bit. Please. Some of it won't. So let's take a look at different categories of effective culture in teams. One of them is, is relationships and bonding, connectedness. That's not all of culture. There are other things in culture like candor and transparency, um, innovation and ideation, uh, accountability, growth and development, collaboration. So all, we've been measuring all of these categories for 20 years and the efficacy of teams. I'm gonna pick one, bonding. The average team and their score on bonding together in, in the pre-pandemic world was 2.8 on a scale of zero to five. And that's answering questions like, my team has my back, 2.8. Or I deeply care about all members of my team and all members of my team care about me. That word all really flips it to being a lower score. Sure. And there's always that one jerk, man. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Sorry. And so that idea of 2.8. Now, what happened was during the pandemic, when you were remote, you would imagine that that bonding score would go down. And it did. It went to 2.3. And here's why. Because, Andrew, most CEOs think of bonding in a methodology I call serendipity bonding. It's the walk down the hallway. It's the coffee room conversation, Right. But there were teams like Drew Houston at Dropbox that said, now that we're in remote, I better learn how to do bonding differently. And so he started engineering practices that would accelerate the connectedness of his team while remote. So for instance, once a week, that team would say to each other, what is our energy level right now and why? And so somebody would say, oh, it's a two. I'm really worried about my mom who's in assisted living and it's locked down during COVID or whatever. Or, you know, I'm a, I'm a one, my significant other got a diagnosis or whatever. Or, or I'm three, this project is draining me that we're working on at work. Now think about this for a second, Andrew. In the olden days, you might have had those conversations serendipitously in small pods. Yeah, you might have had it at the water cooler, been like, oh, I'm worried about my mom. But only in ones or twos. What if now you bring a full discussion in the room where every week you have that discussion? What happens is the entire empathy of the team goes up. So we curated five of these practices that yield greater bonding in a measurable way because we had the data. And if, if a team adopted all five practices, the relational score went up to 4.4 in a remote wow. world. Wow. That's so incredible. So better than it ever was in a pre-pandemic world. So the point is that I'll give you another example, really short one. The average meeting, talk about candor, transparency, having a full voice. That's so important. Inclusion. The average team meeting of 12 people only have four people think they're heard. If you use um, a collaborative document before the meeting, you know, like a Google Doc, and, and you have people answering a question before the meeting, then you come into the meeting, everybody having read each other's answers, ready to collaborate on the basis of everybody's input, eight people feel that they've been fully heard. That, what's that? That's like a doubling? That's double. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's uh, asynchronous collaboration. So what people don't realize is we, we changed where we worked. We had meetings and we moved them to, to zoom meetings or, or teams meetings. But what we missed was the opportunity to actually have, uh, to work up and down what we call the collaborative stack. What do, what do you do in physical meetings? What do you do in remote meetings? And what do you do outside of meetings in asynchronous collaboration? So this became a really important and powerful lesson that we needed to learn about hybrid work, which is you can have greater candor, 
by leveraging the collaborative stack and the tools more effectively. You can get more people involved. You can have a greater degree of inclusion. You can have like, for instance, instead of even having 12 people in the meeting, you could have 30 people opining in this Google Doc. Now you've got greater inclusion, more diversity of input. And then when you get into the meeting, you land the plane with a smaller number of people to wrestle the ideas forward. So I, I just want to make the suggestion to anybody listening and to CEOs that we're, we're a bit lazy in thinking the only way to, to breed collaboration, innovation, relationships is old ways of working. If you adopt new ways of working with new tools, you can radically improve the ways we're working. So the, the challenge I have for anybody listening is don't try to make work as good as it was prior to the pandemic. Leverage hybrid work to make it better than it ever was. And it will include physical work. I'm not suggesting you don't need it. You need physical collaboration for the relational things, for the emotional things, for celebration, for fun, for gritty issues. You want to wrestle to the ground and look people in the eye. That's where you use physical collaboration. So I hope this was um, you know, illustrative a bit to some deeper curiosity on how hybrid work can really make a difference. You guys already know all about ExpressVPN. I've talked before about why they are the go-to service for protecting your online activity. Big tech should not be snooping on us and profiting from what we do in our private time. ExpressVPN can also help access content, including thousands of Netflix shows that might be available in another market. You just beam in, encrypted, surreptitiously, and you can be a UK user, and all of a sudden, all that fun BBC content can be yours. I could go on and on about ExpressVPN. It's the VPN that I trust, and I'm not surprised that CNET, Wired, and others have rated it number one. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang right now and get three extra months of their service for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash yang. Expressvpn.com slash yang to learn more. Well, uh, it makes perfect sense to me that you would need to engineer new practices uh, if you want um, a, a lot of the benefits of in-person work. Um, because if you just uh, like try and do the in-person mode remotely, it's going to be a disaster, <laughs> in, in, in my opinion. Or I guess by the numbers, you know, it goes from 2.8 to 2.3. I actually think that's pretty uh, rosy <laughs> in, in the scheme of things. Um, but it, it sounds like for you, it's maximize and optimize the tools for remote work, maximize and optimize the tools for in-person work, just uh, try and max it out uh, and, and do things much more consciously and deliberately. Yeah, and it'll be better than it ever was. And I'm, I'm out there and I appreciate the platform to ask me that question. You know, when I grew up in the 70s in Pittsburgh, the steel industry crashed because the steel industry failed to adopt new work practices that the Japanese did adopt. The Japanese adopted TQM and Six Sigma before the American steel industry and kicked our ass. And as a result of that, um, you know, it was an entire city was crushed. Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, crushed. And, and I grew up in poverty, recognizing that it was poor management and the lack of adoption wow. of new ways of working that had our, our family suffer the way it was. And so that was my mission. I, I had, at the time, I said, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be governor of Pennsylvania. I'm going to fix manufacturing. People will have jobs. Well, when I moved away from that mission and I moved into a different mission of I'm going to do that through business and through the work that I've been doing at Frazzy Greenlight, you know, I still have been able to accomplish that. It's true, man. Like the the value creation slash value destruction gap between good management and bad management is Amen. so epic. 
<laughs> you know, I, I remember when I was in my 20s realizing that if you just put some shithead in as CEO, he could like wreck an entire <laughs> you know, or, organization. I was like, what? You know, like that company just went down the tubes because that like they brought in this one person. Like, you know, that that struck me as uh, wild at the time. One of the blessings that I think we're going to see around AI is that that mediocre individual that, sh that tanks shareholder value will now be visible. I believe that within five years, software will be able to show whether an individual is raising or lowering shareholder value. In a very short while, AI should be able to assume a, a lot of the resource allocation decisions uh, for a, a company. And certainly to your point, it, it could screen what the heck is going on uh, company-wide relative to each other. It's true. If they're public, if they're private, it'd be harder. Well, no, but just think about this. Even in my own little organization, and I have a small sales force, if AI, if we did employee engagement surveys um, of everybody, which we do, I would be able to see the heat map of where one leader in sales was either increasing or decreasing employee engagement. I would also be able to note based on software and the use of HubSpot and Salesforce.com and those kind of things, I'd be able to note the productivity of individuals. We take all of this insight and I'd be able to see throughput of leads that turn into sales and who touched them along the way. Pretty soon, I'd know exactly who my best salespeople are and I'd know who was poor. I mean, it's, it's going to be exciting you know, to be able to give managers the leverage of that kind of insight um, around data of every associate and, you know, not just for the sake of you're in or you're out, um, but also for the sake of coaching. We're going to be yeah. able to have AI constantly coaching you of where you should spend your time today um, that, that will be able to give a heat map to dialing up revenue, dialing down revenue. It's going to be so exciting. So from your Pittsburgh example, you champion something called radical adaptability that uh, it is uh, not just you, but uh, you're one of, uh, I, I think, the most prominent proponents. Um, we recently went through this crisis around Silicon Valley Bank, um, and I'm sure you had many, many friends who are incredibly stressed out uh, calling you. Um, I did. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I didn't have any personal uh, capital, but I have lots of friends who, who, who were um, potentially watching a decade of work get washed away, like uh, having their, their life savings get decimated. Yeah, I knew somebody that had $3 billion in that bank. It was real. It, it was such a gut check. Um, thank goodness that in my mind it got resolved in the right way, which was the, the, like the depositors. I mean, if you hadn't backstopped the depositors, then there would have been a run on every bank that's not the top three banks. Uh, there would have been a crisis of confidence in the entire U.S. financial system. By the way, warranted, because if you can't count on something as basic as, like, you know, this major bank uh, being solvent the next day, then, you know, your trust in a lot of things kind of dissipates. I realized that that was yet another example of massive value destruction because of poor management. Uh, now, like, happily, the poor management didn't cascade all the way up to the you know, uh, Federal Reserve and Secretary of Treasury and <laughs> FDIC, but it was poor. It was poor risk management on the part of some bank executives at at SVB. Uh, if if there were, and uh, I will say that, uh, like I, I believe that this is going to be the first of many ripple effects of uh, elevated interest rates. That there are all sorts of landmines um, uh, on the balance sheets of all sorts of institutions. Um, I'm not sure where my question is on this one, but <laughs> well, let, me, let me turn it into let me turn it into a piece of advice for our Please. listeners for today. And whether or not you know you're an institution or whether you're an individual, there's two words I want to put together, and you've used both of them: coelevation and radical adaptability. I want all of us to live our lives guided by coelevation and radical adaptability. I'll use myself for instance during the pandemic. Um, I, like many other individuals, invested heavily in the tech sector. I've always been, I've always been, you know, Peter Diamandis, who we're going to see next week is my best friend. And, you know, he certainly has influenced me a lot in terms of the future of technology and its impact in the world. Why wouldn't you believe that these stocks were actually worth what they claim to be worth, right? Because the future of Tesla isn't a car, it's a battery and it's future technologies. And of course we believe this, right? 
So the echo chamber that we could create around ourselves um, could be very damaging. But a diverse co-elevating team, I have a chief operating officer who is basically the co-founder of Ferrazzi Greenlight with me. He's the very first person that came on board. His name is Jim Hannon. Um, and he's one of the most conservative, um, right down the middle kind of guys you'd ever want to meet. One of the most um, wonderfully ethical, solid dudes you'd ever want to meet. Um, and, you know, he was warning me at the time about the index that I had in my portfolio to tech. And he was just saying, he's like, yeah, you know, you're a little indexed in that direction. And the ability to have those voices strong in your life, that, that diverse portfolio, that co Who's got your back, Keith, about being over-indexed? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. That's, that's really the, where I started doing the research was when I wrote this book, Who's Got Your Back? And I realized that we're all more successful when we've got a diverse set of powerful and candid, honest, truthful voices in our life. Now, what's important is that you constantly tap into those on regular agile sprints. So agile has become the operating system for the world, whether we know it or not. Those who are not agile, and I'm not just using it as a descriptor being to be agile, I mean an operating system where you don't imagine uh, five years out. You're thinking of things on a monthly, bi-weekly basis and asking yourself, what have I learned lately? And you take in those inputs and you adjust and pivot like a good entrepreneur would or any engineer running an agile software development, we need to adapt this in our lives. Now, where Silicon Valley Bank missed it is I'm sure they didn't have a diverse set of individuals who are co-elevating in terms of their voices strategically. And I don't know with what agile sprints they worked to question their strategies, but I have to believe that not just a week ago, but more than a month ago, we could have predicted where we were heading with Silicon Valley Bank and the right voices in the room with real co-elevation, which means butt kicking candor, peer to peer accountability, not letting each other off the hook, not just, you know, inhaling the same exhaust fumes. If all of that had been present and they had run their board in a way that I run my executive teams that I coach in these agile operating system, I think we might have seen a different different outcome. Uh, I, I believe you're right. Uh, you know, there was certainly some groupthink in, in that risk management office where they were like, yeah, sure, let, let's go heavy into these bonds and not hedge it and let's make them long term. I mean, that, you know, that ended up being uh, the catalyst to this crisis of confidence that hopefully uh, stays contained and doesn't uh, tear through the, the U.S. financial system. Keith, this has been an absolute pleasure and privilege uh, sharing time with you. I'm sure everyone who's listening to this or watching it feels the same. If someone wants to dig into that brain of yours uh, and that spirit of yours, uh, because you're a remarkable human uh, as well as thinker, uh, how can they keep up with you? Aside from buying all your books, which I, I recommend, <laughs> those are, they all have a lot to add. And, and the, way I, the way I recommend you, go on to Amazon and just read the first paragraph of each of them. And whichever one speaks to you is where to go. Um, but I would, I would say LinkedIn is probably the best format um, to stay engaged with me. And you'll, you know, I, I use that as a platform for my thought leadership. And you can, you can DM me. I'm not going to check all the DMs myself, but I have somebody checking them and screening them to see, you know, who I end up talking to. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably the way best to, way, way to, to max it. out LinkedIn. Iki. That, that, that platform does have an awful lot of potential. Um, I, I Can love tell that. you a quick story before we leave. Oh, no, please. Uh, yeah. Year, years ago, I was at the Renaissance weekend and this was when I had just published never eat alone. And this young man was there talking about creating, uh, uh, this, this platform, this system for deepening relationships. And, and I said, you know, I really appreciate what you're trying to do, but no way you can't build relationships through technology. Um, I'm not an advocate, you know, and at that point of time, Reed just nod his head and said, well, I'm going to go build it anyway. I did miss an opportunity along the way to invest in a pretty significant company 
and I was absolutely wrong in my expectation. Now, I, and because of that miss, I have absolutely embraced all the new tools and technologies along the way to deepen those relationships. But Reid Hoffman uh, built an amazing platform which continues to, to thrive and to grow. So he's doing, doing a great job there. I love that story because it demonstrates uh, humility, learning, uh, and building great relationships. <laughs> Keith, Keith Ferrazzi, such a pleasure, and I'll see you out west in just a few days. I'm looking forward to it, Andrew. Take care. 